The God of the Bible is a God of signs and wonders. But not only does he produce the supernatural to validate who he is and what he can do for those who put their faith in him, the scripture also declares in an ancient prophecy from the prophet Isaiah that in the new covenant era, especially God would make his people signs and wonders in the earth in order to communicate to this world the kind of supernatural divine intervention that can take place in the lives of those who cast their heart the direction of God. This is going to be a powerful insight into scripture that should awaken a spiritual reality in your life. Now, that particular verse that I'm referring to is Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18. And in the Amplified Version, it reads, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and wonders. Now, on one foundational level, that was referring to Isaiah the prophet, and the children that he had, because his children were named with certain prophetic names that foretold what was going to happen in Israel in the years to come. And I won't go into the details of that. However, if you email me, I will send you an article with extreme detailed information about the original prophecy. But we know that Isaiah 8.18 referred to more than just Isaiah and his offspring. It also referred to the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his offspring in this new covenant era. How do we know that? Because in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 13, the writer of Hebrews referred back to Isaiah 8.18 as proof that a new covenant had arrived. And I believe it's in the relational aspect of that prophecy. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me. See, we're not so much filling the role of servants, serving a God who is an authoritarian figure above us, which is certainly the case. We are servants to him and he is our master. But in the new covenant goes beyond being servants of God to being children of God through the new birth. And that's what Hebrews 2.13 was referring to when it echoed the prophecy of Isaiah 8.18. Now, if that part of Isaiah 8.18 was a reference to the new covenant, then the rest of Isaiah 8.18 was a reference to the new covenant. And you can quote it in its entirety and say, that applies to me. Behold, I am the, and the children whom the Lord has given me are for signs and wonders. We are signs and wonders in the earth. That's what I'm called to be. That's what you're called to be. Now, let me define some important terms. What is a sign? Well, very simply, if you go down the road trying to find a certain location, a certain building, a certain store, a certain restaurant, You look for the signs. You see the street signs that guide you, hopefully through the help of GPS, to the right location. And you look for those signs, Smith Street or uh, Keith Street or whatever the case may be. You're looking for the sign to indicate the direction to go. And then when you see the building, the business, the restaurant that you're trying to get to, you look for the sign indicating that building is the location you want. Well, God sets up signs on our journey of the direction we are to go to fulfill the purpose of God. He does that individually. He does that corporately. He does that on small in small ways, and he does that in great ways. A sign 
if you want to technically define it according to the Bible, is a natural token that symbolizes a spiritual reality. A sign is a natural token that symbolizes a spiritual reality. Let me give you an example. What about the sign of the rainbow that was given to Noah? A sign of what? A sign that God would never bring a flood on the earth again to destroy the inhabitants of this world. What is a wonder? A wonder is a divinely orchestrated, miraculous event that causes those who witness it to be filled with wonder, with awe at the greatness of God. A sign points you the direction that God wants you to go. It reveals a certain aspect of who he is or what his purpose is, but a wonder just strikes your heart with amazement at who God is and what he can do. Signs and wonders have always been God's way of functioning in this world, especially to intervene in a significant way. Now, I often hear people say, oh, God, God doesn't want us to ask for signs. Jesus said an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. You can easily misinterpret that statement because Jesus was not saying it is wrong to ask for a sign, but it's wrong to seek for a sign more than you're seeking for God. Some people are enamored with supernatural phenomena, and that is evil and that is adulterous in a sense because you're in love with the sign instead of being in love with God. But if you're in love with God, then you seek the signs to enhance your relationship with him and to draw from him what he desires to do for you. It is not wrong to ask for a sign. And there's biblical proof of that. For instance, in Isaiah chapter 7, Isaiah presented to King Ahaz, who was the king of Judah, the possibility of asking God for a sign. He was about to be attacked by a Gentile army. And Isaiah said, ask a sign of the Lord your God. Ask it in the depth or in the height above. And Ahaz, in a false show of piety, said, I will not ask a sign of the Lord, neither will I tempt the Lord. Really, his root motive was he didn't want to change his agenda because he had already made another Gentile nation an ally so that he would be strengthened against this army that was about to attack him. He wasn't trusting in God. He was trusting in an evil alliance. So he didn't want a sign. He didn't want God to change his mind. And so Isaiah said, Hear me now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, and will you weary God also? So it wearies God when you don't ask him for supernatural guidance. Is it a small thing for you to weary men, and will you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. A virgin will conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And of course, that sign bumped up further into the future and was not applicable to King Ahaz's day, but it was God's way of inserting a major prophecy in scripture, a sign a virgin shall conceive. See, that's a sign of the uniqueness of Jesus to the entire world. Muhammad was born of a natural birth between a man and a woman. That child was conceived and he was brought forth. Buddha was born of a natural conception and birth. A man and a woman came together and in marriage and Buddha was part of the result of that marriage. He was just a normal human being. But when it comes to Jesus, he was the only begotten son of God. He was the only son begotten only of the father. A sign 
that a virgin would conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, let me give you some history, certainly not extensive, not uh, a thorough uh, study of signs and wonders in the Bible, but some very important points in Scripture where God manifested signs and wonders in order to effect a purpose. And the best revelation that could be drawn is from what God did in Egypt. Deuteronomy 26, verse 8 says, and this is speaking about their deliverance from the land of Egypt, the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm. I love that phrase, outstretched arm, because when you stretch something, you pull it beyond its normal limitations. And normally there's a barrier between heaven and earth. And this world functions according to natural laws. And the other world, the kingdom of heaven, functions according to supernatural laws and power. But there are times when God's people appeal to him and cry out to him, and he stretches his hand beyond the normal limitations of the barrier between eternity and time. And he intervenes supernaturally in the lives of his people. The Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with great terribleness and with signs and wonders. God is still the same God. He hasn't changed. And what he did in that era, he can still do now and he's going to do because we are in a pivotal era. We are approaching the last days with great speed. And I guarantee you the signs and wonders that happen in the last days will exceed anything God's ever done on planet earth. Three signs were given to Moses to convince Pharaoh that he was really sent by God with this prophetic word and to convince Israel to accept Moses as their leader. Number one, his rod, when he cast it to the ground, became a serpent, then he picked it up by the tail, and it became a rod again. Water was poured out on the ground, and it became blood. And then another sign, the third sign, was Moses placed his hand inside of his clothing near his bosom, and when it came forth, when he pulled it forth, it was leprous, and then he put his hand back toward his bosom again within his clothing and pulled it out, and it was cleansed. And those were the three signs that God had sent him. Strangely, those signs are all messianic. They're prophetically messianic signs because the rod represents the word of God, and that's a message in itself. But just like the rod became a serpent, the word of God became sin for us. And then God reached down and brought him forth from the dead, and he became the eternal word again. Uncontaminated by the sin he bore and unconquered by the death he faced. Think of that. And then the water of the word of God was poured out into the earth, and he became a blood sacrifice for mankind. And then finally, he was the hand of the Lord stretched forth that came forth from the bosom of the Father and became leprous with sin, but when he was assumed back into God's presence, into the Father's presence, he was restored and made completely whole. So those signs had multiple levels that they were relating to, more than one level, two primary levels. All right, what about Daniel's day? I love the statement that Nebuchadnezzar made after Shadrach, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were delivered from the furnace of fire. And I don't know why we call them Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, because those were heathen names given to them. Their Hebrew names were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And you ask people who Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah are, and most people have no idea, even Christian believers. But anyway, after Nebuchadnezzar saw the fourth man in the fire, and they were delivered, and not one hair of their head was singed, and you could not even smell smoke on their garments. And this is what Nebuchadnezzar said. And he sent out a message 
to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High has worked for me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. And his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion from generation to generation. Now, I believe Nebuchadnezzar was referring to several things. He was referring to how God revealed the dream that he forgot in Daniel chapter 2 to Daniel and how Daniel interpreted that dream. And Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and worshiped God. I'd like to see our political leaders fall on their faces and worship God. God, give us prophets, raise up prophets that will speak in such precise ways that signs and wonders can be produced to turn our nation, the United States of America, or whatever nation you may be a part of, toward the things of God. And then in chapter 3, you have the furnace of fire experience with Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And then in Daniel chapter 4, you have the period of time that Nebuchadnezzar spent in a state of losing his mind. He was insane for a season because pride got in his heart. And then how God restored him to his throne. So he probably was referring to all of those events as signs and wonders through which God had convinced him of his reality and his power to heal, his power to deliver. Then later on in scripture, I love how David said in Psalm 71 verse 7, I am become as a wonder unto many. I'm sure all of Israel were wondering how the shepherd boy could use a stone and a sling and bring Goliath down. There was talk all through Israel about how amazing this is. They were marveling at how the power of God used that young man. A wonder to many. Another translation, the modern English version says, a wondrous sign. That happened for me when I got saved. And I won't tell the whole story here. You can get the detailed story by going to my comparative religion website, the truelight.net, and downloading the free booklet, The Highest Adventure Encountering God. It's on the second panel as you scroll down the website. That's thetruelight.net. And it's a very detailed account about how I was a yoga teacher at four universities. I had several hundred students following my teachings who consider me their guru. And then uh, I was also running a yoga ashram. But I received a letter from an old friend telling me how he'd been born again. So I prayed all day long. I did no chanting, no yoga. I did not read uh, the Bhagavad Gita or any other Hindu scriptures. All I did was read the Bible and pray to Jesus and ask for a sign if he was really the savior of the world. And that afternoon, as I was on my way, uh, hitchhiking to University of South Florida to teach a yoga class there, One of the members of a local prayer group that happened to be praying for me because they read about me in the newspaper. He was two miles away and walking in a laundromat and God told him not to, to get back in his van and start driving. So he got behind the wheel and said, okay, Lord, where do you want me to go? Not knowing that two miles down the road, I was standing there hitchhiking, still praying, Lord, if you are the only way to heaven, give me a sign. When I opened the door to that van, when he picked me up hitchhiking, I got my sign because I looked in and there was a picture of Jesus he had taped to the ceiling. And I knew this is not coincidence. This is a God incidence. And within 20 minutes, I was on my knees praying and receiving Jesus as Savior and shut down my classes, shut down my ashram and started my new life. So not only did I receive a sign, I became a sign. Not only did I receive a wondrous manifestation of God, I became a wonder. Because when I went to my class that afternoon, I took the man who won me to the Lord with me and told them that I was no longer going to teach yoga, that I found out Hinduism is an unacceptable approach to God and an incorrect approach to ultimate reality, and that Jesus is the only way. 
And I became assigned to all of my students, and most of them became Christians also. And uh, praise God, it works that way. It works that way for you. You become assigned to your family members when they see the change in your character, to your coworkers, to your fellow students in the school you go to. You become a sign and a wonder. They're wondering about you. How come they don't come to the parties anymore? How come they don't drink and smoke pot anymore? Whatever the case may be, whatever the description is, you become a sign. Now, when the Messiah came to this world, Simeon, the prophet, picked up that little baby when Mary brought him to the temple. And listen to what he said. He said that he would be a sign that would be spoken against. That's in Luke chapter 2, verse 25 through 34. You ought to read the whole prophecy. So if you are a sign, that doesn't always mean that you will be received, but it does mean that God is establishing truth in this realm supernaturally to be received or to be rejected, but you are the means by which it takes place. And Jesus was to be a sign spoken against, but there were also many who responded to him. And when Peter was preaching the first Pentecost sermon, when the Holy Spirit fell in the upper room, he said that Jesus was a man attested by God by miracles and wonders and signs. And so he indicated that the veracity of Jesus' message and the validity of his ministry were accompanied by signs and wonders in order for them to be proven to those who would receive it and to those who would reject it. They have seen the proof and they've made a decision one way or another. So signs and wonders draw a line in the sand, so to speak. Well, when the church was birthed, it was birthed with signs and wonders. When the Holy Spirit came in the upper room like a rushing mighty wind, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And all the Jews gathered there that day for the Feast of Pentecost in Jerusalem were amazed. They marveled. They wondered. Because how is it that we hear every man speaking in our own language the wonderful works of God? And of course, the disciples that were in the upper room were preaching the gospel in languages they'd never learned. No wonder later on, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it says tongues is for a sign. And I've actually had tongues flow through me that way in a known language. I didn't know it, but the person who heard me did several times. Three times this happened with me. One time there was a Jewish man in my audience that was very unreceptive to what I was preaching. And he was getting more and more cold and indifferent and then at a certain point in the service, I began speaking in tongues. He got wide-eyed, and he nudged someone next to him. He said, does that preacher know Hebrew? And they said, no. He didn't. And at the time, I knew very, very little Hebrew. And he said, well, he's speaking in fluent Hebrew right now. And my friend got excited. He said, well, what's he saying? He's saying that Jesus is the true Messiah and I should repent and give my life to him. And he came to the Lord that night. So these things still happen. And on the day of Pentecost, when Peter gave that famous sermon that birthed the church, the day that the church was revealed in power, he said, this is that that was spoken of by the prophet Joel Thus saith the Lord, in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And all my servants and all my handmaidens, I will pour out of my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. And then in Joel's prophecy repeated in Acts chapter 2, thus saith the Lord, I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. That was one of the ways that the new covenant was birthed into existence with signs and wonders on the day of Pentecost and a prophecy that revealed that signs and wonders should be very much a part 
of what the church is all about and what the advance of the kingdom of God in this world is all about in this age. Let me tell you one more story about when a sign and a wonder happened in my life. Because, see, I want to emphasize again, not only does God want to produce signs and wonders for us, he wants to produce signs and wonders through us, and he wants to make all of us who are blood washed, born again, spirit filled, children of the most high God into signs and wonders personified. We become a sign. We become a wonder. I was the black sheep of my family, and I'm sure when I switched around, they were in awe that such a change had taken place in my life. When I was a teenager, I was a rock musician and lived that kind of lifestyle. And then all of a sudden, I'm an on-fire, passionate believer in the Bible. I became a sign and a wonder. I didn't just receive it. I became it. You didn't just receive those two things. You became those two things. Praise God. Now, I guess if I could pick out one story that would be a great way to close out this episode, it would be the time I was running a tent all around the country. And we had an old dilapidated bus. I mean, it was an ancient school bus that we had bought. And we had a tent that would seat that at that time, about 300. Later on, we got one that would seat about 1,200. But we had it all packed in the bus with all the tent poles, the quarter poles, the center poles, all the stakes, and all that's really a lot of weight. The big tent uh, was made out of canvas, not vinyl like they did later on. And uh, unfortunately, on the way to Tampa, we hit a pothole. And consequently, it dented the rim and the tire kept losing air on that side. And the back tires on the bus were already bald. And now one of them's losing air. And so I went to all the junkyards in Tampa that week trying to find a new rim. And all those old junkyard cronies told me, you won't find one of those anywhere here in Tampa. They said those old split rims have been outlawed and we had to melt them all down to scrap metal. And so they were right. They were right. I couldn't find the correct kind of rim for the bus anywhere because split rims, when you disassemble them, would snap real strongly. And some people got injured very seriously as a result. But anyway, I thought, well, we got to go to our next meeting. It's in Bessemer City, North Carolina. We prayed the whole way. We had one ball tire on the right side and on the left side. We had a tire that couldn't keep air, and we'd have to stop every 30 or 40 miles and fill it up with air. Prayed the whole way and asked God uh, to somehow take care of us. And when we got to Bessemer City, North Carolina, when we pulled into the lot, I was amazed. Right in the middle of the lot were two big truck tires. And I got out of the bus and walked over and they were brand new. And they were the exact size of the bus that we were driving. And not only that, they were mounted on split rims, just like we needed. So now we had two brand new tires for the back mounted on brand new split rims, it looked like, or at least they hadn't been used hardly at all, if at, at all. And while we were putting up the tent, a white dove walked out of the woods and allowed itself to be caught and just perched on our hands. And once we got the tent up, we would release the dove into the tent and it would fly around the tent several times and then come back to us. Apparently it was um, a domesticized creature that... uh that someone had lost or maybe it uh, flew away from the the place where it originally had been. We don't know where it came from. All we know is we took that as a sign, a dove. That's a sign of the Holy Spirit, right? Jesus, when he was baptized, the Holy Spirit descended as a dove. So we took that as a sign that our meeting there would be blessed. And from the very first night, we were packed out 
impossible to fit the people. They were standing all around the perimeter of the tent and dozens and dozens of drunks and drug addicts and messed up people got saved in that meeting. And when I told them the sign, we became a sign. And when I told them the wonder of what God did when we drove up on the lot, we became the source of wonder to them. See, God is still a God of signs and wonders. And I'm praying that he will perform signs and wonders in your life. In fact, if you need a healing, if you need a deliverance, if you need some kind of supernatural intervention, I'm praying right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, you're still a God of signs and wonders. And I declare that the power of the Holy Spirit I feel right now will go to every individual, healing the sick, delivering the oppressed. I cast out and cast away from them every demonic strategy and interference in their lives. And I claim miracles and signs and wonders that will attest to the fact that you are the Savior of the world. You are our Messiah. And we love you and we praise you. Now, be sure to contact me and let me know if God healed you, if you felt something transform your body supernaturally. And I'm praying that God will awaken the supernatural in your life. Now, if you want a more detailed article about this revelation, email me, pastormikeshreve at gmail.com. That's pastormikeshreve at gmail. Dot com, and I will send you a very detailed article about this phenomenal revelation. Thanks for listening.